So I just wanted to say how happy I am speaking here. Sorry about this whole kerfuffle. Um, it's just amazing. I'm quite a new career scientist, so it's amazing to be speaking alongside some really inspiring, um, yeah, amazing scientists. Um, so my research is being undertaken across Tasmania, uh, Australia, and thus I'm a, um, a student at the University of Tasmania in Hobart. And those who don't know where Hobart is, although I'm sure most of you do, um, this is a map of Australia, obviously. And um, just below here, uh, to the southern off mainland Australia is Tasmania, and to the south southeast of Tasmania is Hobart. Now, Hobart's a pretty remarkable place to be doing research. It's about 250,000 population. Uh, and it's a really quaint and lovely little city uh, full of a lot of nature, which makes it really nice to be doing research there, and a lot of lovely people and a beautiful mountain backdrop. Um, so before I get into the explicit uh, nature of my project, I just first want to talk about the birds themselves. Uh, Short-tailed shearwaters, they're uh, an amazing bird, Australia's most numerous seabird, um, and they're a migratory and burrow nesting seabird, meaning they nest in burrows uh, similar to penguins and many other seabirds. Um, so they breed down here in southeast and southern Australia and winter in the North Pacific Ocean, as far north as the Bering Sea, which is over 11,000 kilometres as the shearwater flies. <laughs> um, so uh, there's about 18 million of them uh, in Tasmania, 23 million of them all across Australia, 18 million of them found find in Tasmania. And they're about 40, cent 40 centimetres from beak to tail with a wingspan of about one metre. So they're really impressive oceanic flyers and they can span great distances both during their migration and in the breeding season itself, which I'll get to a little bit later. Uh, and they're a really long-lived seabird, so they can live by up to around 30 years old, which is older than me. So, um, so when you're in a colony uh, with uh, thousands of birds, it's quite remarkable and humbling. Um, yeah, when you're with them thinking they've got more life experience than you. <laughs> um, so they're quite pair faithful as well and, and burrow faithful. So they'll return to their the same mates uh, each year. And uh, not, well, not necessarily the same burrow, it's the same kind of network of burrows, so around sort of a, a radius. Um, and so this is a colony uh, of uh, one a short-tailed shearwater colony. This colony is Cape Deslax, uh, quite close to, to Hobart actually, about 30, 35 kilometer, kilometers away. And this is a time of the day where it's quite nice and peaceful and the birds are off fishing um, but at night at around dusk the sky will kind of be full of activity as thousands of shearwaters uh, return to their burrows it's quite a spectacle it's amazing um, but they're not really that graceful <laughs> on land for as how graceful they are in, on, in, on the water and in the air they're not that graceful on land and they coming in they kind of do a few circles of the colony as they try and slow down and then uh, sort of crash land and sort of just hop around, run around and squabbling before returning to their burrows um, to feed the chicks if the chicks are hatched at that time. Um, so as you can see in this colony, the shearwaters sort of nest in this kind of mass of vegetation and they dig out their burrows, which can sometimes be metres deep and contain multiple chambers. Uh, or they can dig right into the sand, uh, as you can see on this photo on the left. Uh, and even this photo on the left here, it's, um, yeah, it's quite, it's still quite held together with roots, uh, power roots and, and stuff, but they can even get a little bit more exposed than that. Um, and in which case, a, a lot more fragile. So it's a, it can be a little bit daunting walking around a shearwater colony, trying to make sure that you're not uh, stepping in, stepping in a one and collapsing a chamber. So you have to be very, very careful. Um, so here's me in a shearwater colony. Um, a lot of people say that, uh, you know, here's me resting in a shearwater colony. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I'm not resting. I've just got my hand down shearwater burrows and checking for occupancy. And at kind of this close, you know, this proximity to the burrows and, and the colony, uh, you can really smell the shearwaters. Um, and I don't know if there's any seabird ecologists listening, but uh, it's a great smell. It's a, um, it, it, the smell of seabirds is, is something that you learn to love. It's kind of as if the birds have never been fully dry, really. So it's kind of this damp, musky smell, I guess. Um, sort of like when you do your washing and you leave your washing in the washing machine for a little bit too long, and then you kind of like pick up and smell your washing to see if it's, uh, it needs to get another run. And yeah, that damp, musky smell is what a shearwater smells like. 
but excellent. Like it smells excellent. Um, <laughs> so uh, now that I've kind of given you some background, I want to talk about the timings of the cyclical events of short-tailed shear waters. It's also known as phenologies. Um, so, and this will provide a bit of background for my explicit project, which aims to quantify the arrival and departure times of the shear waters using acoustic recorders. So short-tailed shear waters have historically been highly synchronous in their phenologies, uh, particularly in their arrival times to their breeding colonies, um, with anecdotal evidence suggesting that you can kind of set your clock to their arrival in Tasmania in the last week of September. They lay at about 25th, 26th of November and hatch a single egg in mid-January. So it's quite a long incubation time. And once the chick is hatched, the parents will then take it in turns to leave the colony, to head down to Antarctica, just pop down quickly to Antarctic Convergence, as you can see on this map here, um, to, feed for multiple, to feed for multiple days on the productive waters there. And this is what I mean by saying the birds fly a lot, uh, even outside of their migration within their breeding season. Um, so the adult will stay behind with the chick while the other adult is off in a convergence and, they'll, and the other, other adults will just feed offshore so it can return to feed the growing chick every day. And then this, this goes on until the other adult returns and they'll do a little swap and the other one will head down to convergence. Um, so this goes on until the adults depart for their wintering grounds in mid-April uh, and again popping by Antarctic convergence before heading north. Uh, to yeah, really get their bodies in good enough condition to fly. And they leave the poor helpless chicks to their own accord. And this is an example of a um, fluffy, uh, hopeless, but very cute chick. And actually uh, quite a big chick. This is close to fledging and probably a couple of weeks out from fledging. Um, but eventually they'll, it's, they're about 130, 140% size of the adults um, at this stage. But then eventually when they're no longer getting fed from the adults, obviously, they'll lose the weight, uh, lose their down and head off to join their adults. So this is just like a brief phenological history of short-tailed shearwaters, but of concern in the 2018, 2019 and the 2019 and 2020 breeding season, many shearwaters were late in returning to their colonies. Um, so we wanted sort of to devise a project that quantified these arrival dates um, to sort of one, devise a reliable method for detecting short-tailed shearwater migratory timings, uh, you know, to see when they were coming in and at what rate, and to two, see if arrival dates differed between colonies and if there were any environmental correlates that affected arrival departure times, like wind speed, wind direction, mood phase, stuff like that. So to investigate this, to collect the data, uh, you, you know, you can imagine that manually heading out to multiple colonies with the onset of migratory arrival and departure would take an enormous amount of effort and resources, going and returning to the same colonies each day to see how many birds have left, when they leave. So we decided to deploy song meter SM4 acoustic sound recorders. I've got them here for you, but obviously you can't see me, but <laughs> they, um, there's one of the, an example of one of them is in the bottom right of the screen there. They're acoustic SM4 sound recorders uh, provided generally to us by the Tasmanian Land Conservancy. Um, and so, yeah, we deployed eight, uh, 10 of them across eight different colonies in mid-September 2020, just before the onset of shearwater arrival. And then took them in after a month later, once we knew the birds had arrived, and then redeployed them in April 2021, just at the onset of departure of the adults and chicks. And we scheduled to turn them on sort of one hour before sunset and turn them off two hours after sunset. And this is, like I was saying before, really vocal time in, the, in a shearwaters day where they're running around the colony, squabbling with each other, going off to feed chicks. Um, yeah. Um, and this is uh, an example of, um, oops, whoops, sorry. Did not mean that. That was a little taste of, the, if you could hear that, that was a little taste of the shearwater <laughs> um, sounds. So this is a, um, this is a, for my last day of field work on a, um, a beautiful rain, uh, rainbow on my last day of field work. Um, it was just, you know, just a cut. The ra it had been raining all day and I was soaking, soaking wet and the birds had almost gone and then the rainbow came out. It was really quite spectacular. Um, so um, once we retrieved this data, we downloaded it onto the computer where it's currently sitting and waiting to be processed. Uh, well, I'm currently processing it. Uh, and this is an example of a short-tailed shearwater vocalisation. looks like, as you can see, it's quite messy and a bit all over the place and overlapping. 
And what we plan to do is to see if we can build call recognizers to be able to tease apart individual vocalizations and use those detected vocalizations as a measure of activity in the colony. I'm having a bit of trouble teasing apart each individual vocalizations and because of the amount of overlapping calls. And this is pretty current a pretty common limitation in the acoustic monitoring of seabirds. So I'm going to also use acoustic monitor indices to process the data. And I'll play the, if you can hear it, I'll, I'm not sure if you can hear that, but. Yeah, I don't think we can hear that one. Sorry, Harrison. You can't hear it? No, we can't, sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best impression. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, okay, I'll try. It's like, goes like, <laughs> anyway, that's a short tail she would have called. I've heard enough of them to <laughs> obviously still need to refine my call itself. Um, so, yeah, so like I said, it's pretty hard to tease apart each individual vocalizations using a um, uh, using call recognizers, although I am trying. Um, so we're also going to run through acoustic indices to see um, if they, uh, you know, if they can give us some good and valuable information about um, about the shearwater vocal activity. So the two indices that uh, I'm I'm going to use more than these, but I'm, I wanted to run through a couple of acoustic indices that I'm going to use today uh, use for my project. The acoustic complexity index, which calculates the variability of intensities across the entire um, range of the recording. And the ACI assumes that sort of all biotic sounds are characterized by this intrinsic variability of intensities, where human generated noises are more sort of constant, human and non biotic noises are more constant. So it calculates the absolute difference between two adjacent values of intensity in a single frequency bin. And a frequency bin is, it can be, you know, it's like 1000 hertz to 2000 hertz, 2000, that's a frequency bin. And, uh, and then adds together the absolute differences in the first temporal step of the recording. So like five seconds, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, 60, whatever. And then uh, divides that by the total sum of the intensity values. Um, so yeah, and then that's worked out on kind of all temporal steps encompassed within the recording and across every frequency bin. So it's relatively complicated, although it is just a few lines of code, so it's not too bad. <laughs> but um, the NDSI is a little bit simpler, so that just calculates the ratio of biotic sounds to non-biotic sounds in the recording. Um, so it's just, but it considers um, sounds between the frequency band of 1000 to 2000 hertz to be non-biotic noises and 2000 to 8000 hertz to be biotic noises. So it's just a measure of non-biotic to bi biotic disturbance in the landscape essentially yeah so it's pretty easy so like biotic noise minus non-biotic noise divided by biotic noise plus biotic noise that's non-biotic noise that's just the formula for it so it's pretty pretty easy um so i guess the main question that uh we are we're asking is what's the most effective index in detecting short-tailed shearwater migratory timings and for that we wanted to devise some like establishment metrics um so we came up with two establishment metrics is the first and last short tail shearwater vocalization in each colony and the asymptote in the average daily vocal activity of a short tailed shearwater colony. Um, so, yeah, so I wanted to see which is the best indices, whether it's the NDSI, the ACI, or the vocal activity rate, which is the best at detecting these establishment metrics. And so to do this, we were, we were planning to score short tail shear water vocalizations in a subset of the data to determine the effectiveness and we stratify by calling activity. So low calling activity, medium calling activity, high calling activity. So I'm, I'm counting individual short tail shear water vocalizations each recording. So that's my impeccable um, <laughs> impression of a shear water before was because of the amount of calls that I'm listening to. Um, and then we'll compute the average NDSI, ACI and um, vocal activity rate in each scored recording and then fit generalized linear models to investigate the relationship between the manually scored shearwater calls and the output puts of the acoustic indices. Um, so then this kind of leads us to future scope which uh, so we're, once we find the most appropriate index or indices we can then apply it to examine the relationships between colony establishment metrics and environmental variables like latitude wind speed wind direction food availability if the data is available to us 
Um, and this is important because the phenologies of species are shifting worldwide and as a result of, as a result of human-induced climate change. And we think it's imperative to devise a method to track these changes so we can start asking broader questions about the mechanisms behind these shifts. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Harrison. That was incredible. Very no worries. Insightful. Sorry um, about the kerfuffle. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, I particularly loved how well I now know these birds smell and sound. That was <laughs> very, very good. Um, cool. So we've got a good couple of minutes and uh, I guess a couple of questions. Yep. So I know you mentioned future steps. It'd be good to understand, you know, where to from here. Yes, we can, I guess, implement that to uh, and understand if there are those environmental, I guess, um, influences. But, you know, what kind of results are you hoping to see and how are you hoping to grow it in the next couple of years? Yeah, it, it's so it's an honest project. So it is only kind of one year. So it just depends on I, for, foremost, we have to determine which is the most which is the most effective metric in um, detecting these establishment metrics that we've that we've devised. So first, she you want to call an asymptoting vocal activity. So hopefully once we determine that most effective index for instance to say it's ndsi is the most effective index then we can use the, that then we can collect large scale, uh, large amounts of data each year we're using these um, recorders run the ndsi through them and work out when the she when the shear waters are coming in at what rate if that's changing and why are they why are they changing so um we can look at things like wind speed uh, okay are the birds more akin to arriving at times of strong westerly winds or are they akin to arriving in, um, you know, if there's ample food availability in the north in the in the North Bering Sea where they fit, where they um where they winter? So it's 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 just kind of one component of of much larger data sets you're going to need to collect to examine how these phenologies are shifting, um, especially for long long migratory seabirds. It's really tricky to kind of tease apart the these effects because what's happening in their breeding colonies in, in Tasmania uh, might be completely different to the why they're actually arriving late. So it could be food availability in the North Bering Sea or it could be uh, you know, mistimed algal blooms in the North Bering Sea. Um, so this is just kind of one aspect that we need to look at. This, it needs to, to answer these questions. It needs a whole um, synthesis of, of data kind of collected around the world. Yeah, yeah, very, very fair point. Okay, and uh, in terms of the implementation of bioacoustics, do you think that this is something that can be extended out to other bird species or even to other um, other species outside of birds as well? For sure, it's, it's such a growing field, bioacoustics. Um, and bioacoustics have been used kind of extensively um, for the last, you know, five or ten years on uh, terrestrial birds in particular. So seabirds, it's a little bit more novel and it is a little bit more difficult because of those overlapping calls that I discussed before. Um, but if you can get a, a bird with a really nice, clean call and it's easy to build recognisers, then they can say su such amazing things. And um, and obviously bioacoustics have been used to, you know, over the past 20 years or so to detect kind of presence or absence. So, for instance, the, the night parrot bioacoustics we used there to try and detect the calls. Um, but yeah, actually, quantifying like um, quantifying like ecosystem structure and complexity is sort of just this emerging trait coming out of um, bioacoustics, and it's actually really exciting. Acoustic indices can yeah, I've seen a, a few papers that acoustic indices can really say really inform things about the um, structure of communities and the structure of populations and where to best you know divert um, yeah like divert. Um, recovery efforts and things like that. Great. Okay. And maybe one last question. Um, sure. What would you say was the biggest hurdle in your research piece? It's, I, I think at, the, at this time, it's the, um, the call recognizers and building and building the calls. There seems to be a lot of false positives and a lot of false negatives, but the thing is, it's really useful to persist with it because if, if we can tease apart individual vocalizations in a colony, then that is going to be really, really informed. Um, I, I would say that that's the most that's the most difficult thing about it at the moment because with the with the indices, it's yeah, like I said before, just a couple of lines of code and it can, it can spit out a value, which is pretty cool. But 
building the indices requires a lot of trial and error, a lot of trial and error, false positives, false negatives. Um, and I'm still grappling with that kind of now. So I would say that. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine there's a lot of data to go through. So I'm sure um, we'll make things work. But thank you so much for your time today. And thank you so much for the work that you're doing and sharing your journey and your work with us today. Um, it's been very, very insightful. So thank you, Harrison. No worries, Sylvia. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks, Harrison. Right, thanks. Bye.